If you wish to support the channel on Patreon, please follow the links below and be sure to click the bell so you don't miss any of my videos. In case you haven't noticed, Hyper Sentinel is out. Following a successful Kickstarter campaign in February of last year, the new game from Hewson, yes, Hewson, complete with originator Andrew Hewson and his son Rob, who's been donning his spacesuit and taking the game around all the big shows, is finally here. And with its release comes a good opportunity to see how a UK classic has evolved. Now if you don't necessarily want me to blather on about the old days and just want to know about the new game, then my immediate review of Sentinel is that it's absolutely brilliant and you should go buy it right now. Obviously I'll be more detailed later. But first let's look at its origins, which lie with one of the most dazzling games of the microcomputer years. Graft Gold Software have come up a couple of times in my videos before as one of the UK's best developers of the 8-bit days, most of which were spent working with Hewson. Primarily run by Andrew Braybrook and Steve Turner, the list of classics that they were involved in is pretty damn great. The atmospheric and relentlessly obtuse yet gripping Paradroid was first on the C64, followed shortly after by Quasitron on the Spectrum, which was essentially Paradroid with an isometric twist. You'd also find their name on games such as the excellent Gauntlet-esque Wanorama, their absolutely wonderful conversions of Flying Shark and Rainbow Islands, and later on in the Amiga years they'd work with Renegade and make games such as Fire and Ice and Virocop. But their signature title, in most people's eyes? That's gotta be Braybrook's Iridium. Iridium, in 1986, was a serious technical showcase of just what the C64 could do, which is one of the reasons why it became such a big seller. After getting its name from a likely misspelling of the element Iridium by Robert Orchard, who is credited accordingly, Iridium presents a fresh and blistering take on the space shooter. The goal of Iridium is to take your ship, the Manta, and blow up as much of the surface of the enemy ship, a Super Dreadnought, as you possibly can, being pursued by enemy ships and beset by ground guns and the dreaded Iridium mines all the way. In Defender-esque fashion you can go left or right, and you can also speed up and slow down. Once you've blown up enough of the base, you land on it, initiate a self-destruct sequence, and then fly off for a final pass as the Dreadnought gets blown to smithereens. Technically the game is awesome. It's colourful as hell for a start. The C64's hardware chip allows it to run at top speed, a brisk consistent 50 frames with no sweat. It's also one of the first games to feature a type of parallax scrolling, in that while you're darting at high speed across the ship, the stars in the background stay still. At least they appear to be in the background. As the C64 does not support parallax, this was done by making the actual enemy ship the background, and the space and stars characters on the foreground, which counter the scroll of the screen by shifting left and right with your movement. It's quite nifty. And you'll certainly have time to appreciate that with Iridium if you want to complete it, because you'll be playing it for a long time. I have no hesitation in saying that it's one of the hardest games I have ever come across. The difficulty is monstrous. Your Manta dies to everything in one hit, and ships come at you all the time. Home in Iridium mines require difficult movement to deal with. It's not so much evading them, it's that doing so often leads you straight into a barrier on the ground. You have to get into this really complex rhythm while playing Iridium. There is a certain timing to knowing when ships are going to come and how to deal with them. You're going to want to do this at high speed, because while you do need to slow down at times, doing it too much is just going to leave you a sitting duck. So you manage the ships and the mines while trying to destroy everything on the ground and oh yeah, don't forget about all those walls. You're going to want to memorise that immediately. There's a lot to take in. Oh, and you only get three lives to start with, and there are no continues, my friend. To be honest, I haven't even got past the first level of Iridium without a trainer for infinite ships. I respect the game utterly, I think that it's a technical marvel, and clearly the execution of the game is at a high level. But it's way too hard for me, and I don't normally chicken out of hard games. It's an utter behemoth, especially as it originally was on the Commodore. Still, that was the case pretty often with games back in those days. It's often said to the point of cliché, but it is true. 
Iridium is a beast of ungodly proportions, and it might leave you screaming and running for the hills, but it is a superbly made game indeed. Of course, it was such a hit on the C64 that versions were released on other machines. It has to be said that this didn't necessarily reflect well on said machines, because it showed something inherently negative about them. Iridium simply can't be replicated fully on either the Spectrum or the Amstrad. Not only is it lacking the awesome sound effects and music, although the Amstrad really does make a good effort, but it's just lacking that high octane scrolling to boot which is very important to the game. Still, they certainly tried. The same also applies to the Atari ST version. This has more of the colours of course, but all three systems have one thing in common. They struggle with horizontal scrolling, which means they really struggle to emulate Iridium. The Specchio Amstrad versions are good for both systems at least, but I do fancy that ST owners of the time might have been perplexed that their ostensibly much more powerful system, because as we all know memory was the only sellable measure of power in those days, was not able to do as good a job of Iridium as the C64 did. The same also applies to the DOS version. It's not bad, but it's just not C64 level. Even the most powerful machines of the day seemingly couldn't get the job done. I fancy the DOS version just wasn't coded that well, but bloody noses are certainly being dished out here. Aside from the C64, however, there are other very good conversions of the original. The first was the only console version, which came out for the NES. Now this is an odd one. Mindscape bought a license to release a game based on the film The Last Starfighter in 1990. A successful film at the time, although said film was by that point six years old. Not that this was uncommon for Mindscape, who at the time released plenty of licensed games based on old films, such as Dirty Harry, Mad Max and ugh, The Terminator. Appropriately enough, Mindscape decided to get a license for the then four-year-old Iridium for a NES conversion, which was then released under the name The Last Starfighter, even though the game has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the film. I believe that the ship's sprite has been changed to resemble the one from the movie, but aside from that, yeah, it's Iridium. It's also a bit easier than the original, but everything's pretty much intact, so this odd little duck represents a decent conversion of Iridium. If you've ever played the Terminator though, you might have wished that they'd done a similar thing there and sought a decent if completely unrelated old game to twist into a Terminator license. But alas, they didn't. The other one, which is very obscure indeed, came out for the BBC Micro. To my knowledge, though I could be wrong, the Micro didn't have a dedicated graphics chip in the same way that the C64 did, which often allowed for the latter's amazing feats. And yet AIM made an awesome conversion of Iridium for the BBC in 1987, in which the only thing that's truly missing is some of the colours due to the system's reduced palette. Other than that, the speed, gameplay and difficulty have all been retained. For the system it's on, this is a truly magnificent conversion. The BBC Micro wasn't often known for arcade style games, making this take on Iridium quite unknown and all the more marvellous. Top marks. The game was also made available for the Wii Virtual Console, obviously that's not got anything missing and is a perfect emulation of the C64 original. Another thing worthy of mention is Iridium Plus, which came out the following year. This is pretty much the same game as the original, but the maps are different. And <laughs> hoo boy. This is the four super players version of the game. If you were able to master the original and all of its tricks, from the hair trigger reactions to effortlessly flying on your side, then get a load of this. It's red flagged, guaranteed to destroy you utterly. Now an absolute incompetent like myself naturally can't get anywhere here, but it's a good deal if you want more, even harder Iridium. And after this, well, the series took a break for a while as Graft Gold made other games, mostly with Hewson as their publisher. However, by the end of the decade, Hewson were in pretty dire financial straits. This was around the time when they were re-releasing just about everything in budget mode, and later on shipping games out to the cover tapes. Graft Gold had to move on. They worked briefly with Ocean, and also with Telecomsoft, whom you probably know better as Firebird. 
After disastrous deals with Microprose and Activision that nearly killed them, they found solid ground with Renegade, the publishing imprint of the Bitmap Brothers, and it was here where, in 1993, they would make the long-awaited sequel to Euridium, cunningly titled Euridium 2, which came out for the Amiga. Euridium 2 is a fine sequel, as these things go. It's essentially more of the same, fly ship around a base, destroy everything, and then land, but with a few little changes here and there aside from the obvious technical upgrade. I find this game to be a bit easier than the original, which I think is mainly because even though you still die in one hit, the ship itself is smaller and the play area is a lot bigger, so there is a bit less chance of crashing headfirst into a wall, which generally was the way I died the most in the original. There's a bit more of a difficulty curve to this, I reckon. The earlier levels are a bit more forgiving, although it certainly becomes a challenge later on. And naturally you've got some good music, and some power-ups to help you on your way. I like this sequel quite a bit, although the one thing I can't really get with is what happens after you land. You get this minigame where you go inside the core and have to blow it up. The pilot has weird thrust type controls while also being pulled towards the damaging core, and it's a multi-part fight but the same every time. You don't have to destroy the core in order to pass the level at least, but I do think it's a bit out of place. It doesn't feel like the regular game at all, to the point where the pilot can actually take multiple hits, while your ship is destroyed in one, which to some people might not make sense. Other than that, yeah, the game is good. It's worth blasting through every now and again, or in my case, blasting through the first few levels before I get creamed. It wasn't as big a success as the first game, but it got some good notices, including a 94% from Amiga format. Speaking of the magazines, Euridium 2 did get a very detailed write-up over the course of its development thanks to Andrew Braybrook himself, who kept a diary of the game's development cycle, which was released in monthly instalments in The One magazine. One of those things that's very interesting to pour over if you're interested in the whole development process. Alas, there would be no more Euridium after this. Graft Gold again moved on to other projects, but after largely struggling through the 16-bit era, they would never be able to survive in the 32-bit era. After their only two PS1 titles both failed to sell, the company folded in 1998, joining the myriad of other companies, large and small, who didn't make it through. Houston, of course, were by this stage long dead. They'd closed in 1991 after years of financial struggle, with Andrew Houston and others going on to form 21st Century Entertainment, as well as being part of Elspur, for which Andrew was the founding chairman. Everything was quiet for many years on the Houston front, until 2013. Finn started twitching with a book, Hints and Tips for Video Game Pioneers by Andrew, which got a successful Kickstarter. And from there, Houston consultants started gradually returning. Andrew, his son Rob, and John Ogden pulled together and brought the name back. Their first game, Hyper Sentinel, was successfully funded on Kickstarter in 2017. The game's release represents the first Houston game in many a year, using the imprint Huey Games. And appropriately enough, it goes all the way back to one of the Houston games that people love the most. Hyper Sentinel, at its core, looks a lot like Euridium. Once again you fly from left to right across a base and destroy all the ground targets. You can speed up, there's barriers, plenty of home in mines, surge enemies as they're called now, and waves upon waves of ships coming for you. You'd expect no less. But very quickly, things get different. It's not that Hyper Sentinel is more forgiving as such, but you do get an energy bar this time around as opposed to just dying in one hit. Good thing too, as you'll probably be getting hit quite a lot as you try and get with the game's rhythm. This was one of the odd little curios about the original. Simple haphazard knee-jerk reactions just weren't enough there, you had to get with a certain timing in order to actually succeed. And Hyper Sentinel retains this, which is very welcome indeed. The structure remains similar, but again it evolves. Euridium had the main stage, then landing, and initiating the self-destruct sequence, and the sequel had a minigame style boss battle which didn't change. Hyper Sentinel has full on boss battles that you have to win, and they're one of the best parts about the game. The shooter bosses, Guardians as they're called, here are. Mm -hmm. They feel classic and often quite intimidating, especially when the music starts blasting away. 
The style of the original, it turns out, is great for producing some pretty epic dogfights against tricky opposition. There's often a pattern that you have to figure out, and it's rewarding when you start to time them just right. There's also an abundance of weapons this time around. Iridium didn't really have any, Iridium 2 had a couple, and this game has loads. You have freeway shots, homing shots, machine guns, lasers, and my absolute favourite, the triple ball and chain. I love exactly this sort of weapon. Completely different, tough to use, makes you turn and turn like an idiot, probably pretty useless if you analyse it technically, but it feels so good. And so satisfying when you're smashing ships up with it too. It's like full throttle in space. In Fantasy Zone style, you only get a minute or so with each weapon before reverting back to traditional blasters, so there's always going to be change-ups, and the default weapon is also just fine. And of course, old school sound effects make it all better. The way the game looks just can't be ignored. This is one of the best looking Neo Retro games I've seen in a while. There's some games that obviously have higher fidelity, but Hyper Sentinel just looks perfect for what it is. There's great pixel art, but it's got that slightly harsher edge that you would expect from European blood, as opposed to the smoother Japanese style. There's a dreaminess to the game, a sort of psychedelia, like it took a quick detour via Llama through Jeff Minterland. The high octane nature of everything makes it feel like it could be right at home on the wall of a club. There's so much going on all of the time. Euridium really took a step up here. It's like Rob, John and Andrew looked through the 30 years that had passed since the original, and in Deus Ex fashion they kept it alive by augmenting it. It's an ascended humanoid type game. And it just plays so good. If I have any complaints about it, it's, well, perhaps there could be some even harder modes. There is a retro mode, in particular this increases the amount of barriers on the ground, meaning that stages really do have that serious Euridium turbo tunnel feel where you're dodging obstacles left and right, but I am actually surprised there isn't a die in one hit nearly impossible mode, as impossible as that would be. You do get survival and boss modes for each stage though, and other nice little extras. There's great looking graphic modes for CRT, C64 and Spectrum style graphics. Oh, and it's got some of the most pumped up, arse blasting chiptune music you'll find anywhere. In case you can't tell, I quite like this game, and I'm struggling to find much that's at all wrong with it. This is because truthfully, I'm not all that good as a critic, I'm just a fan. In conclusion though, God damn, you need to play this. I loved pretty much every bit of time I spent with Hyper Sentinel. I want more of it even, and there's some other little things I haven't really looked at here, like the mixer mode which is apparently one of the deepest integrations that a game has had so far with a live streaming service. It's a fantastic game of course, but also a great evolution of what came three decades ago, and pretty much the perfect way to bring the name of Hewson back to gaming. They've been missed, and hopefully they won't be going away anytime soon. Bye for now. The community pours lavishings of hot praise upon the following. Adam Schaefer, Alex Stoko, Alexander Jazeri, Andrew Dalton, Andy Capt, Daniel Briggs, Daniel David Taylor, Dustin Cooper, Gary Pinkett, George Newton, Graham Blackpool, Ian Roberts, James Id, James Loveridge, Jason Durso, Jason Goy, Jason Stevens, Jace Alexander, Josh Jensen, Lee Norris, Martin Pataki, Morton Scanning, Nanette McCrone, Nicholas Tristan, Olaf Albeen, Peter Jack, Peter Sidorn, Phil Taprog, Piotr Margell, Pocky Southmaid, Rachel Maxwell, Romeo, Ryan Burford, Sammy Lee, Samuel Victor, Scott Coulter, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Stephen Warner, Tanya J, Yurka Operator, and Zach Roach. Thank you all very much.